We're here chatting with Chris Keel about what the FMCSA is doing. Chris, thanks for coming to the podcast. Hey, you're welcome, man. Thank you. So FMCSA, they're talking about electronic IDs uh, for the level eight inspections and other things. ELDs potentially required for pre-2000 models uh, and speed limiter rules. What's going on? Well, you know me, I'm all about more regulation. I think it's uh, good, you know, to add it and apply it because then it just helps us uncover and peel back the layers and help people out. So we get to help people out a lot more with the uh, tremendous amount of regulations that come out that don't make sense. So to push back on that, FMCSA, uh, the ELD regulations, there was a study that came out that basically said crashes, has it really been an issue? Safety, has it really improved safety? You got the COVID uh, waiver for the last three years, really, with the pandemic, that there was only, what, two recorded crashes for people who have been taking the waiver, so they, the hours of service waiver, and doesn't seem like it was an issue. Safety, is it being an issue? Are they solving the problems? It sounds like through ELDs, they're not solving the, the, the crash problem necessarily, but there are other issues that they are alleviating or capturing potentially, like uh, inaccurate um, mileage when you're you know, driving, or actually getting maybe accurate, more accurate fuel taxes um, processed. Um, and uh, other documentation that might be more on point with hours of service to get better information to see if that would be a contributing factor in future, um, tightening up hours of service more so than just implementing ELDs. So potentially, um, you know, a lot of that stuff takes years to kind of figure out to see if it has an effect. Um, and in the interim, there's a lot of back and forth on whether it's you know, um, something to continue or to, you know, double down on. And it sounds like double downing is the way to get to a faster response on that. And a lot of this is circulated around safety, compliance, safety scores, DOT audits in general. And it seems like the ELD at least helped alleviate some of the hours of service uh, issues that was going on. Can you tell me more about audits, safety, and maybe some recommendations for carriers to stay safe on the road? <clears throat> There's a lot of people that own ELDs, uh, and I think that from our experience with uh, new intern audits and compliance reviews or focused reviews that are looking at, you know, hours of service and 395, uh, well, a lot of people that have the ELD, they don't have them hooked up correctly. Um, they're not truly an ELD. They're still in AOBRD mode. Um, People don't understand that each driver needs a specific login for their, themselves. They can't have multiple. Uh, you know, one day they can't log in as somebody else and be driving under that. So a lot of these issues are coming up and uh, throughout the audits, it's still a prevalent issue where the FMCSA thinks that they still need to define and redefine how that's going to be, uh, you know, um, a good measure or a good tool to start limiting some of these things, but what they're finding out is the tools aren't hooked up right uh, to get accurate information. So um, potentially by enforcing it on everybody, maybe that's better knowledge for everybody then, and then not everyone just with the CMV that needs them, but um, more people have them. Potentially it's better education for everybody then, instead of just you know, the few that are qualified to have an ELD or, or not qual or say qualified not to have one. They're escaping the rules. But again, with uh, the more knowledge that people have and the understanding of what the true, uh, um, what it all boils down to, saving, the FMCSA and DOT is trying to save lives, whether they came to that you know, conclusion yet, they're still working the formula out to get that, that point. So it's all good faith. You know, sometimes change sucks for everybody. Um, you know, especially us when they may implement something and then there's a lot of confusion um, or there's some nuance to it depending on the operations kind of gray in some areas or whatnot. That stuff is not easy to define and interpret, but usually once they hear enough of these questions, they do come out and make a further determination on that. So, Right, and know. Chris was mentioning education. You can go to cnsprotects.com. We have hundreds of articles discussing everything on the DOT regulations, DOT audits, how to improve your safety scores, trucking insurance, and so much more. 
Um, and one of the things, one of the regulations was that came out was talking about speed limiter rules. And we had some truckers during Driver Appreciation Week actually have some ideas and thoughts on do they like or do they not like the uh, speed limiter rule. Roll the clip. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a professional driver. All right. They hire me to be a professional driver. I drive my car legally and all that other stuff. I ride a motorcycle legally and all that. Stuff. Give me my speed. You know, give me not because I want to be a speed demon, right. but at least let me keep up with traffic. Right. Okay. Uh, the speed limiter. I, I, I mean, if you want to want to bring it down to within reason, like right. 70 miles an hour. We're governor 70 miles an hour. Actually, our trucks only do 69. Even on our governor <laughs> 70. You don't need more than that. Right. You don't. Now, if you're running out west, you're in states 80, 90 mile an hour. I don't know if they have lanes, you know, set up for, for the slower vehicles, but I've already seen accidents where one big truck is rear ending another big truck because of the speed difference. So, Chris, what's your thoughts on the speed limiter rule? Uh, well, just like, you know, any good driver, I want more control. Um, I don't need uh, a computer to think for me. I don't think it can in some areas, or especially if you're in the city and there's somebody walking. Um, you know, there's other little things happening that maybe uh, technology can't pick up on just yet. So, yeah, if I'm going to get in trouble for it, I want to have more control over it. And then just what we've heard other uh, fellows say that they might have maxed out different speeds. Some might be at 65, some at 69, some at 75, I've heard. Um, you know, all those different maximums, you can't get past them if they're, you know, one's tr one truck is at 75 and he's trying to pass someone at 70. It's just a, you know, five mile an hour uh, difference there, but it's a slow pass. So everybody behind them, we've all been behind those trucks. Yeah. There's like two in front of you, in, uh, left lane, right lane. And you're like, why can't they just get over? Why can't the one just get over? And it seems like they're, you know, never really moving or whatnot. Uh, that's probably because they have limiters on there. And again, imagine everybody having that. Well, the trucks are just gonna be more of a problem to get around. And again, for the truckers, it's the C-class drivers that are the ones that are the problems with their impatience, trying to get around uh, things. And, and they don't understand how hard it is as a professional truck driver, uh, all the things that they have to consider, um, you know, the amount of size and whatever the cargo is and then the time restrictions because that's their job to get there as quick as possible and maybe they can take an extra one, you know, and make a little more extra money uh, within that, you know, time constraint. But uh, the more stuff that, you know, is thought through to prevent, you know, me from making my own human decisions, uh, you know, I think it's uh, not a great, a great thing. Um, but again, in the event that it's trying to save lives and it's the process of going through and figuring out, uh, is this actually doing something? I'm all for, you know, trying to change things and figure it out. But again, if at some point we implement this and it's not working, then we have to have some sort of, uh, way to pull the string or cut the cord on that quickly, especially if you're in a rush. that <laughs> so speaking of things not working very well sometimes so a lot of these transitions with these new big regulation changes sometimes the fmcsa makes mistakes dot auditors make mistakes can you walk through some of that uh what's the process to either fix mistakes fix violations that maybe uh, it shouldn't have been on there because it wasn't you um i know that with the uh, fmcsa and dot at different you know different levels they have um, a lot of their um, uh, employees have retired over the last few years. A lot of them were getting out 2017, December, when the ELDs came into effect. They didn't want to learn, you know, the new processes, and whatnot. You know, especially when you're at the, the tail end or a year away from retiring or whatnot. Um, and what I understand now is there's a lot of new uh, agents in the field. And there's a lot of new um, uh, auditors performing these audits. And guess what? They get their information just like we all do, uh, depending on what source they're getting it from or who trained them, whatnot. And not everyone has the right, correct information. So, uh, you know, it's something where we're a compliance, uh, you know, company and partner for 
a lot of our clients, and we like to also have integrity with the FMCSA, but we do come across things that are being told. Uh, you get one order that says this, and another order in the same state that says this. Um, it's usually the experience level and where they got their information, who's coaching them. But we like to sh ask them, where in the regulation are you coming up with this new, uh, you know, this new version that you're, you're coming back to us? Um, and we ask them for it, and if they cannot provide it, you know, it's pretty simple. If you can't find it, you know, it's probably not there. If you're, where are you, you know, again, where are you coming up with this new idea that you're just, or new regulation, basically? Um, we want to see it in the book. If it's in the 49 CFR, prove it to us, and then we can interpret it from there. But uh, if you can't find it, I don't know, sir, it's not there. So uh, find something else to show me. But that's kind of what the, how it works. And again, as politely as possible, let them know that we, you know, we're getting paid to do this for a company, and it's not anything personal. But we're not going to give you more than what's required, and we're not going to give you uh, something that's, you know, again, just not it's news to us. But well, we want to know about that. And again, things change, and uh, there might be something like a nuance between a state. Uh, they might prefer something differently or to receive it differently. But usually everything's standardized with you know, the federal level. But again, with these new officers in the field, um, there are mistakes, there's are, there are processes to go about challenging that, especially if it's a roadside, uh, potentially a data queue challenge. Um, you know, we'll do the trick, uh, removing an incorrect violation or if points were assessed wrongly. Um, you know, as long as we have proof or it got thrown out in court, um, we're just, you know, basic good documentation lining up uh, what the officer said and what the actual rule is. If we have proof and, you know, pictures or timestamps or, uh, you know, things that are concrete data, then we have a, a possibility of getting that removed. Um, and then if, you know, in the case of a data queue, if there is an officer that was in the wrong um, through the data queue process, uh, they will get educated on the correct way to go forward uh, by their supervisor. So again, that's kind of a remediation process for some of those uh, uh, wrongly determined violations. And um, it's something that we see, but you know, sometimes we learn some interesting tips on how some of these uh, officers take a, take a look at some of the carriers that are out there, what they're looking at. Um, it's just kind of interesting to see the evolution of discovery. But again, um, it's always gonna be out there probably. And even as we uh, age and you know, we're the old guys in the room, I think uh, you know we might be learning some, uh, continue to learn new stuff, but or the FMCA will, uh, FMCSA will evolve the their ways, and um, you know I don't know. It's always going to be a uh, uh, he said she said, but we got to figure it out and actually have proof and point to regulation, you know where we where we're coming up with the stuff. So, in short, uh, there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know even. Uh, Good truck drivers with good safety scores still uh, do their pre-trips wrong, um, you know. And, and again, how do they communicate to the officer? Maybe they accidentally said something wrong, and the officer wrote down what they said, but they didn't mean it that way. So yep. maybe it's the not necessarily the officer interpreting it wrong. It's the driver saying something incorrectly himself and not knowing that he's saying something or walking into a, a violation. So if the FMCSA, you know, is coming up with all these different kind of changes and safety maybe is an issue, but yet they're sort of flip-floppy or the data isn't showing a lot of changes, what would you recommend to companies for staying safe, staying proactive on the roads, whether it's a company or whether it's a driver? Well, I think it uh, just relates back to, you know, proper education and then also the proper communication to get that ed education to the person and have it retained um, and then follow up on it and make sure that not only am I going to tell you, I'm going to ask you again if you remember it, and then constantly keep pounding it in to create a culture of this is a, uh, an important thing to remember. And, um, you know, so a lot of what we do at CNS, you know, we get clients that have uh, conditional or unsatisf uh, unsatisfactory ratings. Um, they're in a sort of a world of hurt right up front. And how do we go about fixing that stuff? Um, obviously, we have to do an upgrade request and corrective action plan to address all those violations, critical and acute, and then the, um, other violations with systems and processes. But uh, beyond that, it's having drivers 
uh, investing time in your drivers and in your own vehicles, which are the two biggest costs, and making sure that the drivers understand how the vehicle works and uh, can spot issues as a driver, spot vehicle issues, understand um, you know, how your vehicle is communicating back to you when it starts up or little things that might sound like something's going off or wrong. That's like good communication between you and the vehicle. Uh, and again, everyone has different levels of communication with their car. Everyone has maybe, you know, maybe your truck or whatever has, she has a name or not, or, but you know, it's something to get, get a good relationship with the vehicle, or if you change vehicles, understand those vehicles and what the parts are and how the parts look different from um, you know, brand to brand. That's important. Uh, not everyone drives the same truck all the time, but a lot of those components work in the same way. If it's a you know, braking system or if it's a, a steering column, a lot of the same parts are there. So you should be able to understand that stuff. It's good education. And then, you know, understanding the feedback and how things feel when they are about to break down. And, you know, just knowing that and having that intuition helps. But, you know, not everyone has that, so you gotta coach that and teach it. And that's a time investment. Not everyone's gonna be a, uh, you know, someone to pick that up after one conversation. Yep. And you have to beat it in over and over and over. Again, it takes time and it's frustrating to do that. Not a lot of people like repeating themselves, but again, it's a culture change. And once you actually break into it and you actually get people uh, responding in a good light, it'll probably catch on quicker. And then those people will be good stewards of the, the, you know, the education and, and communication to, to their fellow uh, drivers. So it's breaking in and getting, having an impact and getting it to be contagious. Um, that is what's important. But you know, also implementing systems and processes, you know, simple things that are simple to us, but, you know, if you're a uh, construction guy and potentially you're, I hear this all the time, you know, I'm really good at laying pipe or I'm, uh, you know, really good at uh, laying concrete, you know, what, what, whatever you're doing. I don't really know about the DOT rules, and that's where we come in, but, uh, you know, again, all that stuff is, well, this is the standard, this is a process of which should fit for most people, but we gotta kinda of tailor it to actually have a, a real world solution. Because if you have guys that work around the clock uh, seven days a week, it's not easy to get them together all at the same time on a Saturday morning, like some companies have that uh, luxury of having a quarterly safety meeting. Um, so you have to find good ways to have impactful uh, you know, systems and processes impl implemented and hold people accountable uh, that they're using those systems. So. Uh, that's kind of a lot of what we do in a nutshell, but with a lot more nuance and um, right. layers of regulation and peeling back, like understanding our clients and how they operate. Uh, that's another big part of it. And again, just, you know, someone calls in and says, hey, I want to do this or I want a DOT number. What else do I need? Well, how do I assess that? I need to understand what you want to do. I need to understand everything, really, to correctly make sure that you're compliant. Um, because if you're only going to give me a piece of the, uh, you know, a little sliver of what you're doing right now, and there's no like, uh, you know, foresight of future goals or what you want to do in the next 30 right. days, next 90 days, next year, um, you know, some of these things that you're signing up for, to uh, you know, run into Canada, for instance, or if you're looking to, uh, you know, up your vehicle weight limit, that changes everything. You know, now you're, you know, say you were 18,000 pounds in Pennsylvania, now you're going to 27,000 pounds. Uh, well, you're now you're doing IFTA, you're doing IRP, you're now CDL, obviously, you're in a clearinghouse, you're drug and alcohol testing. Um, there's a lot more things that just go along with that, you know, qualification of the driver. So are we asking the right questions? Is always something, or do we ask enough questions to truly understand and evaluate so we can give the proper, uh, you know, report on what's needed. Yeah, and it sounds like basically information is key, whether it's data queue, having information there, sending it to the FMCSA to show data. You can go to the cnsprotects.com. We have the best audit guide, DOT audit guide uh, in trucking on our website where we cover all of this information from DOT audits, warning letters, data queue process, and so much more. And, you know, if we can't go up to Colorado and chat with, uh, you know, the FMCSA training uh, that they go through over there, uh, maybe they should go check out our website as well. You can go to cnsprotects.com.